Halo, halo, słyszymy się? No ja słyszę. Jak nasze wsparcie? No to pozostałych jeszcze nie ma, ale... Tą prezentacją wstępną jakoś się podzieliliście, rozumiem? Znaczy tam jest pomysł, kto jak prezentuje. Pewnie będziemy się przekrzykiwać, ale z tego co wiem, to ja mam pokazywać, w sensie ja mam szerować ekran, a potem zobaczymy. Hi. Hello, hello Stanisław. I'm your host for today. Cześć, cześć Aniu. And uh, I need to uh, inform you that we need to speak English because everything is live streamed and recorded. So please. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. The UN uh, rules, we need to speak English. Okay. So is there anything we need to know from you, Anna? Sorry, Przemek, my, my, uh, my headphones were muted. Could you repeat, please? Yes, at, at this point, is there anything that we need to know from you? Nothing else. I just want to uh, uh, confirm that uh, there is uh, also Zuzanna Polak joining, uh, Mr. Szymaniec, Kowalczyk and Bukowski, yes? For the whole uh, yes, panel? Yes, that's correct. All right. Yes, that's so correct. Uh, okay, uh, I wait for Zuzana, Zuzana will be Zuzana will be reporting from the panel. Okay, but sh 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 uh, should she has uh, the panelist uh, function granted or uh, it's enough that she's just attendee? Um, I don't know. According to the instructions, I think she should be panelist as well. Okay, okay, great, great. So then I wait for everyone and then we'll have some uh, official announcement. Uh, okay, I see uh, Mateusz is uh, is already on, but he he's not granted the panelist okay. status, so we don't see I'm him. I'm just here. doing it right now. Okay, done. Hi, hi everyone. Welcome. Hi. Hello. Okay, can you see the the presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Maybe maybe turn on the full screen option because the URL is visible. I don't know if it should be. <laughs> Better? Maybe someone will edit our presentation with using the token on the link. Bonus is checking my audio. I turned the volume down. So how is it now? Fine for me. 
How is my voice? Is it okay? Too loud or? I'm just fine. Just fine. Okay. Okay, so how do we deal with questions from the audience? I see that there is a question and answer panel. Like, do we wait until the panel discussion or do we answer all of the questions as they appear? <coughs> no, let's, uh, let's just leave time for Q&A after the panel. Okay. So we, we'll see how the panel goes. Now there's, I think, too many questions. But um, yeah, some some I decided to be optional, so we just make sure that we allow enough time for Q and A. Okay. Our presentation is not that long, I think. Yeah, and also it's better to have too many questions, and then you know we can just cut some of them instead of having too few, and then it'll be like, okay, we have still half an hour and nothing to say. We'll Tom X says he'll join in four minutes. Okay, I'll grab my tea then. Be right back. And in the meantime, Anna, I see Susanna is already in the waiting room. So join the attendees there. So if you can promote her. Is the event going to be streamed on YouTube? If you click on the live, on custom live streaming service and then copy streaming link, it copies the link to the YouTube AGF channel. It is streamed, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And even more in the stream, there is already a video The current one? Yeah, but it's like it's the title of our presentation, okay, but the video is like totally different.
because we are waiting for another presentation to finish. It's the it's uh, in the in, in it's, it's in the queue. So sometimes the live presentation is five five minutes uh, uh, delayed, unfortunately. So because we have the so don't worry, you will be live streamed. <laughs> Uh, Rev, can you share the link uh, on, on Mattermost so and actually send it to someone? Yeah, but look, it's, to, we're just uh, sending it, that info. But look, it's like the title is of our presentation, but the streaming live ended like an hour and a half ago. Hmm. So I don't have a link to, to our stream. Well, I mean, maybe it will actually replace it once it starts. Yeah, uh, maybe. So regarding Q&A, uh, will someone read this to us or should everyone has this open? What's the plan? We can read to you, but then we will read all the questions. So uh, if you follow the uh, Q&A uh, uh, discussion, then maybe you can choose the, uh, okay. the questions. It depends on you. I can read everything if you want. Uh, okay. So okay, so okay. Anna, are, are you taking question? Are you taking care of the Q and A, or should I do it? No, I I, I think it would, it would be better if you uh, decide which questions and in which order you would like to answer. But if you want us to read uh, at loud the Q and Q and A questions, uh, uh, we can do it. Of course, it's not a problem. It de uh, it's an entirely depends on you. W which kind of support you need from us? Um, I, I think I can handle it myself, so oh, okay. Okay, let, sure. let me moderate it. Okay. All right, good. So I, I can I can handle the questions, uh, just dismiss them or, or open them, the panelists, I'll take care of it. Okay, uh, so just to make sure, uh, Przemek, we are still waiting for Mr. Bukowski. That's correct, he, sh okay. he should be already with us two minutes ago. Yeah, he just showed us uh, that, he's, that he's here. No, I don't see him in the attendees. No, he's not there. Tom Tomek is in the room, by the way. Yeah, with the skull emoji in the name. Oh, yes, true.
Okay, uh, since we are just about to start, start I have um, uh, I, I have two information for you. Uh, please mm -hmm. be informed that this session is recorded and hosted under the IGF Code of Conduct and UN Rules and Regulations, and uh, that the chat feature is for social chat only, and only the que question and answer feature is used to ask questions. Thanks very much. Have a good uh, discussion and session. Thank you. Mike, that's one, two, three. Do you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yep. Thanks. Okay, I think we are ready to start. Um, my name is Przemek Jaroszewski. I work for NASC Research Event Network in Poland. And I welcome everyone to uh, this IGF Day Zero session. Um, the idea of this session came where Poland was to host physically um, this year's IGF World um, uh, event. Uh, and the idea was to, to promote Poland and uh, young old skills in cybersecurity, uh, which are actually quite impressive because um, two of the uh, Polish CTF teams are regularly uh, in top five in the world. And uh, if you don't know yet what CTF is, we will have an introductory presentation shortly. Uh, followed by the panel discussion, followed by the Q&A session. So uh, if you have any questions for the panelists in the meantime, please hold them. I mean, you, are, you can, of course, type them uh, in the Q&A at any time, but uh, they will be addressed after the, after the discussion. And uh, the idea uh, is also not just to promote the, the skills of Polish hackers on the light side of the force, but also to, to make you open your mind uh, slightly about the CTF competitions, to, uh, to show their value uh, for, for the business and uh, for education of, uh, of, of youngsters and for attracting them to actually use hacking skills for the benefit of the society uh, and for the, for the internet users rather than for malicious purposes. Uh, so, we have four guests, four panelists that kindly agreed to join us today. Uh, from um, Threat Network Society, we have Stanislav Podgórski. We have uh, Michał Kowalczyk, also known as Redford, co-captain of uh, Dragon Sector. 
also from Dragon Sector, Tomasz Bukowski, also known as Kaidi, and uh, Mateusz Szymaniec uh, from P4, the founder of the team. Uh, and we will start, I think Stanisław will start with the introductory presentation to help you understand what we are talking about, what the CTFs are, and uh, then we will discuss the, the topic in more detail in the panel. So okay. Uh, hello. Uh, this presentation will be very short and just introductory for people who don't yet know what CTFs are, or uh, or maybe not uh, not as much as they would like to. Uh, and like the the quick outline of what we are actually going to talk uh, here will be first a short introduction, like who we are and why are we even qualified to to speak to you about this topic. Then briefly, what uh, what is actually capture the flag contest, especially specific, especially for people who are not yet uh, familiar with it. Uh, then we want to outline uh, some highlights why people why we think people should play CTFs, and then we want to show some examples of what kind of problems you might actually find on a CTF. And then we actually want to uh, to have a panel discussion and Q and A. Uh, yeah, so let's start with with like a short introduction. Apart from what uh, Przemek already said, uh, this is like a short outline of, of who we are. So as Przemek said, my name is Stanisław Polgórski. I uh, play for the TFNS team. Uh, I used to play for a couple of years with, with P4 team uh, with Mateusz before. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as my work, I, I work as a software engineer at the European Southern Observatory. So this is, uh, I'm actually kind of, uh, old person here because I don't work in security as it is. I actually do it only, only as part of CTFs. Uh, maybe others can also like say two words about themselves as well. Yes, okay. So I'm Mateusz Szymaniec. Uh, I work as, an, uh, as a software and security engineer at Zed Polska uh, at the NASC uh, Research Institute. And I'm also the co-founder of the uh, P4 CTF team. And I play CTFs for uh, seven years now. I'm Michał Kowalczyk, and I'm vice -cap captain of Dragon Sector. I work in a small security consultancy firm. And I also play CTFs for, I think, seven or eight years. Yeah. Tomek? Yeah, so my name is Tomasz Bukowski. I also play in Dragon Sector uh, for like seven years. Uh, 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 private, privately, on my uh, work time, I'm working as a uh, cybersecurity consultant in one of the global banks. And uh, yeah, I, I'm a graduated physicist. Okay, so we can move further. And now, what even is a, a capture the flag contest? So, in like in three words, it's, it's just a team-based computer security competition. So you can think of it as you sometimes have, uh, for example, contests in like solving algorithmic problems. And in this case, it's it looks kind of similar, but what you're actually solving are problems related to, to computer security. Uh, and there are different formats of how you can actually uh, play those kind of competitions. Uh, like the three main ones that are more, most common are the Jeopardy, Attack, Defense, and King of the Hill uh, competition styles. Uh, the Jeopardy one is uh, similar to what the, the picture that you can see actually on the presentation. So you have different categories of problems, and then you have different challenges worth different uh, uh, amount of points. So if you solve a challenge worth a lot of points, then this is the, the amount of points that you get awarded. Uh, and then, of course, whoever solves the most uh, the most problems, then this is the this is the winner. So, the the important part here is that the challenges are usually unrelated. So you have just a lot of challenges that truly really, uh, coincide with one another. So you can have different people working on different problems. Uh, I don't know if there's anything special to add for this. Uh, the other style that you can play is attack defense, which is very different uh, uh, in its core, because in this case, every team gets their own uh, computer infrastructure. So imagine that every team gets their own server, which is running some applications. And then the idea is that those applications have some vulnerabilities. 
and the teams have to first f find those vulnerabilities in their own applications, fix them, but also once you actually find the vulnerabilities, you can figure out how to actually, you can exploit them uh, on the infrastructure of, of your opponents. So if you know that there is a uh, there is some problem with the software, you can fix it yourself, but you can also make an exploit to, uh, to basically steal some information from your, from your competitors, and this is how you get points. So you get points for defense, if no one is actually able to hack you, and you get points for attack, where you can actually attack other people and, uh, uh, and get some secret information from their infrastructure. And the last, uh, least common probably, uh, is the king of the hill. Uh, kind of competition where the team who is sort of winning something is actually the only one that's getting points. So imagine that there is a, uh, I know there is a machine that you need to take control of, and only the team who is actually controlling the machine at this moment in time is actually getting points. So everyone else is actually fighting over it and trying. And of course, the person who is actually in control tries to protect this from from all the other competitors. Now, most of the CTFs currently are played online. Uh, if, you, if we look at the numbers, I think last year there were 195 ranked CTFs, so quite a lot of them. Most of them are online so, uh, and taking place during weekends. So you, uh, you played for 24 hours or for, uh, 48 hours do, during the weekend. Uh, but some of the CTFs are actually taking place on site. This is usually for the finals. So teams, I know there, there might be like a thousand teams playing online for a qualification, and then maybe 15 or 20 teams will be invited uh, to some conference or to, to some other location to, to play on site uh, for sometimes for prizes. Uh, okay, so where does the name CTF actually come from? So the the idea the 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 name comes from like a like an old game which I think in some countries is actually played in in Poland is not very popular but the the idea here is that you're supposed to get some kind of proof of solving the challenge so in in some in for example it might be that there you, what you get is encrypted data and if you are able to break the encryption and recover what what was initially uh, what was initially there, this is, this is your flag. This is just a proof that you managed to break the encryption and you can actually get, uh, get awarded some points. Or it might be the case that, uh, for example, there is a website and if you manage to uh, log into this website as an admin, then you actually get some, some specific information that only admin can see. And this information is also treated as flag because this is a way to prove that you actually solve the problem. So you, if you manage to log in as an admin, then this is like a proof uh, for, the, for the organizers that you managed to do it and you can get uh, some points for that. Uh, and now, uh, like a qu quick recap, like who even organizes this contest? Because uh, sometimes it's, as we said, like uh, there, there might be like a thousand teams uh, playing the, in the contests online. And this means that you need some kind of infrastructure. Someone actually needs to pay money to, uh, to host it. Someone actually needs to prepare the challenges. And uh, there are many different uh, parties that actually uh, organize the, the CTFs. There are, some, there are some companies like Google, like Google or Trend Micro who organize their own CTFs. So their security teams basically prepare the challenges uh, host everything and then invite people to to play. Uh, some of them are, uh, are so there is a DevCon CTF HitCon or uh, on the Chaos Communication Congress. So there are big conferences where uh, organizers of the conference uh, make uh, make this as part of the uh, part of the tracks on the conference. There are some universities that have their university teams. This is especially uh, I think popular in the in the United States where there are a lot of uh, university teams playing CTFs and they organize uh, contests as well. And there are also some, co some contests organized by the government. So there is uh, the, the European Cybersecurity Challenge in Europe. Uh, there was the Cybergun Challenge in the US made by DARPA. And there was also a hack a -sat contest made by the United States Air Force uh, uh, this year. So there are many different uh, parties that, that are interested in organizing and hosting these CTFs. Uh, and now going more into like deeper deeper into what exactly are CTFs because we, we just talk okay who organizes it how like how this is outlined but what what kind of problems actually people 
have to face when they are actually playing CTFs. So there are different categories. There are more uh, there are more categories when you actually play. For example, we have challenges which uh, are cross section between different, different different categories. But this is like the main outline of what you can actually uh, what you can find in, on a CTF. So I don't know if someone else maybe wants to. Uh, Okay, so uh, so the first category we put here is reverse engineering. So this is uh, the category which tries to answer the question, what does this program do? So what happens is that you get a piece of software. It might be uh, like a compiled application, might be, uh, uh, might, be, might be something else, might be sometimes it might be even hardware uh, modules. And the idea is to, to understand what it actually does. So like the, the most common, uh, most common version of this challenge is just a password checker. So you have an application which asks you for a password, you put the password in it, and the application tells you if the password is correct or not. And the, what the, what the uh, people playing CTF have to do is actually to understand how does this application verify the password. And then once you actually know that you can, you can figure out what is the proper password and this will be your flag to, to get your points. Uh, different kind of challenges are the, the exploitation challenges. So this is more trying to answer the question, can we do something more than this, uh, this application allows us to? So what you get is again, uh, an application, but this application might actually has, have some kind of security vulnerability. So maybe there is a buffer overflow somewhere, or maybe there is uh, some checks that are not, not, properly, uh, not properly done. And this means that if, if you know how you can actually force this application to do something more than it was intended by the, by the initial uh, programmer of this application. And for example, this might allow you to execute arbitrary code on, on a server from where you can, for example, steal uh, or read the flag which, which will award you points. Uh, a similar kind of uh, challenge, to, but uh, using different technologies, uh, web challenges, which is, uh, Again, you get access to some kind of application. In this case, usually it's a web application. And you again need to find a way to actually do something more than this application normally would allow you to do. So it might be, for example, uh, the idea that you can log in as an admin somehow to this application. Maybe you can steal admin's credentials, or maybe uh, there is uh, uh, like an old version of the web server running there. So this is what you have to do. You have to understand what exactly is happening there and how you can do something more. Uh, cryptography challenges are, as, as I mentioned before, usually it's, it's just a, a simple setup where you get something that's encrypted, you get an encryption algorithm, and you actually have to analyze what is, what, what is wrong with this encryption algorithm, and then you can actually break it. Uh, and there are also forensics challenges, which is uh, basically uh, just trying to, to figure out something from, so you might get like a memory dump of a, uh, of a server after an attack, or maybe you get a, a image of, of a virtual machine and then you need to actually understand what happened uh, what happened in this uh, uh, on this machine so for example it might be that this is like post attack analysis you get uh, you get a memory dump someone attacked your machine and then you need to actually understand what did they do to your machine maybe they uh, maybe they left some traces and this is what you actually have to recover there Okay, so uh, going slightly deeper into what, so what CTF challenges actually require you to have uh, is that you need a very broad skill set to actually, actually work with, with CTF challenges. This is because, as I said, some of the problems might actually span different categories. So it's not, it's not like you have a very plain, uh, I know, plain reverse engineering problem. It might be that this is a reverse engineering problem which includes some very uh, complex cryptography and then you actually need to have this uh, uh, cross-cutting uh, skills or you need to have a team of people who actually can work together to uh, to solve this kind of problems uh, and sometimes you have uh, uh, like those staple problems that you can that you can work with as i said it'd be something like a simple password checker but also in some other cases you might work with uh, some much more complex exercises uh, and this is not unusual for security researchers to make CTF challenges to showcase their research. So someone found uh, some kind of interesting vulnerability and they actually make a challenge just to show other people that this, this kind of problem exists and 
asks other hackers to actually try to uh, try to work on this problem. Of course, this is much easier because CDF challenges are very distilled. So we have a very small application, for example, which showcases the problem. So it's much easier for people to focus on this particular problem and then find again like this the same vulnerability that the the, uh, the initial uh, reporter found. But uh, it's it's kind of a way to uh, to to promote it. I think many people are not really interested in just uh, just spilling it out, just just saying, okay, oh, I found this vulnerability. It's more like, okay, you can try to find it yourself. Uh, and now we want to show uh, some examples of le less uh, uh, less regular challenges. So something that was uh, like quite interesting, even for for people who actually play CTF, something that was actually unusual. Uh, I don't so, know who, yeah. yeah. So th those are examples of, of like screens, screenshots of solving challenges. And sometimes you need to, for example, analyze network traffic or ana analyze uh, signals, like you can see on the top right screen. And sometimes you, you edit a binary. So basically the challenges are very broad. So you actually need to understand all the all the layers and uh, but basically understand everything around you in computer computers, networks, sometimes even physics. Okay, next slide. So for example, th this is a challenge from DEF CON 22 CTF. Uh, during the CTF, I think on the first day, organizers approached, th this was on-site CTF, organizers approached each team and gave us this small device. And the challenge was that this was a simple text uh, communicator, you could select other teams and send short text messages to other teams' devices. And of course, our task was to take over other devices. So we had to first reverse engineer the device because we uh, we didn't have sources. We just got, got this device and that was all. So we had to reverse engineer the device. Then we had to find uh, some bugs, then write exploits, attack ad other teams, steal secrets, and also at the same time, we had to patch our own devices. So this was quite a complex challenge, but this is very, I think, useful skill set to learn because, for example, you have similar problems with IoT devices. Okay, next one. Thanks, Rob. Uh, yes, sorry. So on, on the left side, this, this is a photo from a CTF in Russia. There, uh, one of the tasks were was a small let's say a toy city, but this, the city was connected to a real SCADA system. And you could gain extra points for hacking that control system. So this, this was a simulation of a, a real industrial setup. And the right side, I think this is from someone from P4. Yes, uh, so the photo is made by me. And uh, here on the laptop, uh, we see that uh, uh, we see some output from the radio connected to my laptop. And the CTF was uh, Trend Micro in Japan. Uh, and the problem was that uh, we had to uh, literally extract uh, the flag from the air. Uh, and the problem was that um, some of the pagers systems uh, used in uh, Japanese hospitals uh, weren't encrypting the data as they should. So uh, the company, the Trend Micro, did some research on this topic and uh, decided to 
showcased uh, this, this problem uh, in ACDF. So uh, we had to do everything that, that Trend Micro researchers did and uh, literally recover the flag from, from the air. Okay, this is an example of, uh, of yet another challenge. This was a challenge on uh, Spam and Hex CTF. Uh, uh, the, the challenge name was Tempest in a Teapot. And the, the idea here is that uh, what we got was a, a reading of like radio frequencies picked, picked up by an antenna from a screen that was actually behind the wall. And the idea here is that, I mean, maybe you, you can't clearly see on this uh, picture on the right, but because it's not that easy to actually recover a very readable picture, but we actually had a bunch of them from which you can actually, you can actually see on this picture that there is actually outline of what you, you should see on the screen. So there's like this top bar with, with the password, and then there's okay and cancel, and then there's actually password in the middle. So once you actually uh, are able to, to tune in the parameters and then uh, recover the, like a lot of stills like this, you can actually read what, what was the password. So the idea here was that you can actually like eavesdrop on, uh, on a computer that's actually in the next room just using an antenna. So this was kind of a uh, unusual, unusual kind of problem that you can, that you can face on a CTF. And that's, uh, and that's the reason why we have Tempest protected uh, classified networks. Yeah, so maybe I take it, uh, take those few sides. So uh, from my experience, there were one of the basic benefits of playing CTF is actually when uh, a decent standard computer user is uh, hitting the situation with a problem, when the computer is denying uh, to work, like uh, getting an error message, your, you know, your Word document is shutting down, uh, your application is crashing, your operating system is crashing, uh, everybody gets frustrated but not the CTF players. Uh, those people uh, are used to that kind of situation. And most probably this situation, like you're getting an, an unexpected error message, means that this is the just the beginning of the really interesting uh, journey into the code of the application that you will just uh, be debug debugging over a few, few next days or hours. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, another one is that we, we all can uh, go and obtain any kind of certificate, uh, any kind of online, online training, uh, read any amount of books, but uh, nothing will be better than the, just a hands-on experience. One of the US generals uh, once said that the more you sweat in the peace, the less you bleed in the war. So after, there's nothing better than hands-on experience. Yeah, next slide. And here's, here's the summary of a uh, um, subjective list of benefits. So basically, the, some, something called out-of-the-box thinking becomes uh, some, uh, something natural to, to you because uh, as uh, my colleague said, uh, there is nothing that you should expect from the CTF. You can expect that you, sh you that there will be a lot of interesting tasks, but you cannot uh, make any assumptions like what kind of technology they will use, uh, what kind of platform. For example, they will use some exotic CPU. Uh, everybody get used to work on heavy time pressure because uh, very often CTFs are. Mm, highly time limited, like you have uh, 48 uh, or uh, 24 hours to solve uh, a lot of uh, security related tasks. Uh, the well common, commonly known approach like I don't know this because I don't know this yet and uh, <laughs> well do I learn this. So even if you don't know, for example, the architecture of the specific CPU, this is not a reason to give up. This is just a reason to start le learning about the new architecture. Uh, a lot of practical, up-to-date knowledge on the threats, exploitation processes, uh, mostly because uh, very often tasks that one can find on the CTF competition 
uh, are uh, related to newly discovered uh, bugs, uh, newly discovered, uh, new, newly published and fast exploits, uh, an ability to understand, uh, replicate, evaluate, and mitigate recent vulnerabilities. This is highly useful when you're uh, working in a company and some part of the risk assessment process uh, is uh, involving you uh, as an expert. Uh, so with that knowledge, with that uh, background, you are able to uh, evaluate how critical such a vulnerability is. Uh, is there any way to really quickly mitigate that vulnerability before the vendor will be able to release a patch? Mm. Last two points, uh, learn uh, how to work in a team. Uh, of course, the whole team is under heavy pressure. So uh, yeah, this, this uh, working later in a company uh, corporation is uh, bread and butter. And uh, one of the most, the most important, you will meet a lot of IT security people from around the world and you will be able to exchange uh, your knowledge with the, those people. OK, thanks. OK, now this, uh, those two pictures uh, showcase how CTFs might actually look like from the participant point of view, especially the ones that are on site. So if you can actually go somewhere, the, the one on the left, this is from Google CTF finals. And the one on the right is from Insomni Hack in Geneva. So if you have ever been to, to a hackathon, then it looks a bit similar, especially like the uh, massive one, like, like Insomni Hack, where I think there are like 500 or 600 people playing at the same time. Uh, and now we wanted to show uh, a couple of unusual contests. So we talk a bit uh, about the, the challenges and we, we showcase some, some strange challenges, but there are also some contests which I think are worth mentioning here as well, just to just to see the, the whole overview of the uh, of the CTF scene. Uh, so the, the first contest that we wanted to mention is Hackasat, which happened uh, earlier this year. It was organized by the United States Air Force. And the idea of the contest was to bring together specialists in, in computer security and people who have some knowledge of, uh, uh, of aeronautic, uh, aeronautics and, uh, and aerospace engineering. Because the idea is that uh, there's of course, you know, computers are everywhere. They are also in planes or in, in rockets and the spacecrafts. But people who are experts in security are very rarely also experts in uh, in space systems engineering. So they don't uh, they don't necessarily come together. And the idea here was that uh, there was a qualifier round, round first with uh, with hundreds of teams. I think more than a thousand teams uh, took part. Uh, and the challenges, apart from regular uh, CTF security challenges also involved some kind of uh, astrodynamics uh, and astrometrics uh, challenges. So you actually had to show that you know also a little bit, or at least you had to learn a little bit about the, uh, the space, uh, space domain. And then uh, top, I don't know, top 16 teams probably uh, qualified for finals. And for finals, we got to actually work with some real hardware. So first thing that we got is what you can see in the picture here. Uh, each of the, the qualifying teams for the finals got uh, their own flat sat. So this was a, a small cube sat, which was mm, uh, which was there for us to get familiar with the kind of hardware that we will be working on during the, the final challenges. So this this we could actually just unpack, plug in, and uh, try to play with it, just to understand how it works, how we can communicate with it, and uh, how this uh, how this whole system works. And then during the finals. Uh, during the finals, we got access to uh, similar satellites that were in the infrastructure of the of the organizers. So they were here. You can see like a carousel. So each of the satellites were actually was uh, floating in vacuum on an air bearing in uh, in those uh, those glass boxes, and it was actually on a on a carousel. So it was actually spinning, and there was also a, a sun simulator there. So there was a, there was a reflector that was actually pretending to be sun. So you could actually you control those satellites. So you can actually see spin them of the, the air bearings and you can also like point them to the sun because the sun was also moving on the sky because of the carousel so <clears throat> the idea of this of like the whole setup of this challenge was that uh, 
basically you lost control over your satellite and you have to regain it. So basically the, the kind of challenges that we, that we had to face was for example, getting access to, to ground-based infrastructure, which, uh, which we initially lost uh, access to. So you actually had to, uh, in this case, hack to, uh, through a web application and get access to, to the server that was actually running the, the ground infrastructure for the satellite. And once you could connect to the satellite, you actually had to debug all the problems with it. So uh, there was, for example, a software module that got deployed on the satellite, which was blocking a lot of the commands. So you had to uh, work your way around it to regain control. So for example, to point the satellite to the sun and to recharge the batteries without even having full control over the uh, all the commands that you could send to the satellite. And then like the next problems was to actually reverse engineer and understand this uh, this uh, software that was implemented by the uh, by this uh, fictional attacker of the, who took who took over the satellite, and then once once you actually reverse engineered it, you could find that there there is actually a, a secret way to to gain access again to your satellite. So you actually had to develop an exploit to do it, and then the idea was that you would also uh, be able to. Uh, to use the payload on the satellite, which was a camera, and then uh, take a photo in, like, inside this room. And this was the, uh, let's say, like the, the on the ground part of the challenge. And there was another part of this uh, of this whole exercise, which was the so-called on orbit challenge. Which uh, the idea was that we also got information about some specific satellite that was actually in orbit of Earth. So, what like this, we got some. Uh, like parameters of the satellite. And the idea was that we were supposed to prepare a set of maneuvers for this satellite to take photo of the moon. Uh, and this, uh, this was uh, kind of like King of the Hill style uh, problem because only the, the best team would uh, have the opportunity to actually try to execute those commands on the real satellite in orbit. And this is, this is the picture that we got because uh, uh, playing together as a team Poland can into space, we actually managed to uh, to come up with the best solution to the uh, to this problem. So we prepared uh, the commands that would uh, most provide the, the best photo that we could actually get from the satellite that we were assigned to, and we actually got to execute those commands on the satellite and then uh, take this uh, this moon photo. I mean, it might not look like much, but uh, it was definitely a, a lot of fun to actually be able to do it. And because it was such a special CTF, uh, we didn't uh, take part, it, part in it as AP4 Dragon Sector teams separately, but we decided to join our forces. Uh, so members of Dragon Sector and uh, P4 and some of our friends, uh, we created this one uh, big Poland uh, Kenny to space team. And we managed uh, to, uh, to score second place in the qualifiers. Uh, and then again, uh, second place uh, in the finals. Plus, of course, uh, uh, getting the the best plan in the honor bit challenge and uh, taking a a little bit overexposed uh, picture of the moon yes and one more interesting uh, uh, like a variation of a ctf that is probably worth mentioning is the cyberground challenge that was organized by darpa in the us and the idea here was to, again, bring together people from different fields. So in this case, the idea was to bring together people from the computer security field and also people from the artificial intelligence field. Because the, the whole idea of this contest was that you were supposed to prepare a computer system that would play CTF on its own. So you would have to create sort of uh, AI that would be able to, uh, for example, reverse engineer binaries and find vulnerabilities in them and prepare exploits automatically without any human intervention. And the interesting part of this uh, of this uh, challenge was also that there was a lot of development in the fields of in the field of tooling for uh, for security research and and uh, and also for CTFs, where there were a lot of tools that got developed and and released as as open source tools, which were necessary. Necessary to, to be able to actually participate in this contest, but they were never never done before. No one actually spent enough time to, to prepare such tools, and this actually caused like emergence of uh, of a lot of uh, of a lot of interesting applications, like uh, uh, software for uh, for analyzing binaries, but with uh, uh, I know what uh, what's the what's the name of it. Uh, 
Anyway, well, basically, normally you actually have two approaches to, to analyze, or maybe three approaches to analyze uh, software. So you can do uh, some kind of uh, static analysis, so you can try to disassemble or de decompile the, the application and try to understand how it works just from looking at it. You can do dynamic analysis, which is you, you run it, but with uh, some instrumentation and debugger, and you try to understand what the application is doing from this side. But uh, in this case, they actually did something like symbolic execution. So uh, sort of combination of the two. So static code analysis, but also trying to understand how the data flows through the application. So there are a lot of tools that were actually made for this, which allowed this uh, cyber grand challenge to actually uh, be happening. And then I believe the, the best solution to this, uh, uh, to this challenge, so the, the best computer system was later taking part in the DEF CON CTF and trying to uh, play against uh, like humans who actually were playing the DEF CON CTF which I think they, they it actually got like last place. So still like the, the AI is not uh, not stronger than humans, but it definitely was an interesting idea. We shouldn't worry yet that the computers will replace us in the field of data security. At least not yet. Uh, yes, so uh, another special uh, type of contest is the European Cybersecurity Challenge. Uh, so it's a challenge that the European Commission uh, came up with, and the idea was that uh, each of the European uh, country would make its own, uh, like the national team. Uh, and the national team that uh, its members are age limited, so uh, you have to be uh, 25 years old or, or younger to, to, to be in that team. Um, and uh, in the first edition, only three European countries uh, participated, and then each uh, each year more countries were uh, were invited. And in uh, 2017, I think uh, it was the first year that also Poland uh, uh, participated in, in this contest. And as uh, Third Polska, uh, we got uh, uh, we got to make the the national qualifiers, like to, to actually came came up with, with the Polish team. Uh, and then also prepared them for, for the finals. Uh, so even though uh, like the European Union uh, participates in costs and stuff like that in the in the in the uh, like the participation of the in the organizing the finals, um, each, each each winning country uh, gets to organize uh, the finals uh, next year. So here in the photo we have uh, finals in uh, London. And, and I think that the Romanian team won uh, that year, so they got to organize uh, finals in uh, 2019, last year. Uh, well, because of COVID, uh, the finals uh, in 2020 were cancelled, but uh, we hope that uh, uh, next year situation will uh, be uh, like less difficult and, and uh, we'll get to, to participate in the uh, in the ECSC next year also. Okay. Okay, so th this is the, the end of this introductory presentation. If someone wants to have access to the slides, then there's a QR code you can scan and, uh, and see the presentation. And now we, we await uh, some questions. Okay, uh, thank you Stanisław for the introduction. And uh, just to remind uh, the participants or to inform those who just joined the, the whole idea of this session is uh, now to try to convince you that uh, this is not just fun, but also has actual um, benefits for your career, maybe for pursuing career in cybersecurity, but also it has benefits for the, for the employers. Uh, so why not allow the uh, why not allow your staff to maybe think out of the box uh, in the city of competitions or maybe it's not a good idea we'll, we'll see from the discussion and uh, please challenge us in the q and a so again at any time you can type in your questions into q and a and we will address them after the uh, after the panel uh, and now for a, for a warm-up question to, to follow up you in your presentation, this all sounded like fun, but uh, mostly for those who already know a lot and in many disciplines, like you said, uh, that many tasks require you uh, to have very broad 
set of skills and, and the knowledge from different disciplines. So um, what was first in, in your lives? Was it uh, interest in cybersecurity or was it CTFs? And um, how did you combine those, those two? So who wants to take the question first? Rev, I can start, to... I think, yes. Mm, so when I convince, when I try to convince people to, to participate in CTFs, they also, they, they often uh, tell me that it's not yet the time for that. Like they need to learn something and then participate. Uh, and I don't quite understand that because like the whole idea and maybe, maybe not the whole, but uh, most like most part of the, the CTFs is like the learning process. Uh, so people shouldn't be discouraged when they try to solve a task and then, and they don't know how to do it. Or even if they, if, uh, it takes them more time that the, the CTS, the, the CTF lasts for. Uh, so when I started doing CTFs, I was mainly software developer, so I didn't know that much about uh, IT security. And CTFs basically like solving the different tasks in different categories. Uh, that is like responsible for 90% of my IT security knowledge uh, when I started professionally working in uh, in ITSec. Uh, so yeah, CTFs were uh, were like my gateway to the IT security professional world, and uh, this is this is what I recommend to everyone uh, who maybe wants to see if uh, like the IT security is something for them, and maybe later uh, change careers into uh, into IT security. Also, it's worth mentioning that it's, there are a lot of CTFs. So it's not that all CTFs are extremely hard. You can find entry level CTFs, for example, Pico CTF, which is intended to be entry level. So you can actually try to, to look on ctftime.org for CTFs, which are intended to be entry level and start with those. Yes, I highly recommend Pico CTFs. Uh, these are the uh, CTFs that were mainly oriented for high school students, um, but nowadays uh, they are still online and uh, everyone can uh, try uh, their skills in, in them. Yeah, I, I think it's also <clears throat> worth adding that, uh, and I, I hope everybody here in the panel will agree with me, that uh, almost in every major big CTF, uh, we often hit the task uh, containing some technology, hardware or something that we don't understand yet. So uh, I think the approach like that you need to have a really high security related knowledge to start as a myth, because uh, on daily basis in a CTF, uh, competitions, you will find uh, areas that you don't know yet, and you need to familiarize yourself with that. You need to gain that knowledge. Uh, so just by starting, uh, start participating, you will just you know try uh, be able to to see what you are you are still missing, and just start start uh, use that as a start for the learning. As an example, I might add that. I didn't know anything about uh, Android reverse engineering uh, before I started doing CTS. And uh, once I started doing this, those tasks and uh, learned the topic, now uh, in my daily work, I can reverse engineer Android uh, based malware. Stanisław, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes. So, so from, my, from my point of view, uh, coming back to the, to the initial question, the CTFs were actually the, my first, uh, like more practical uh, entry into the into the security because I, I am a software engineer. I I graduated from from computer science degree, so of course I mean during the curriculum there were some security related courses, but not very not very deep deep ones. Uh, and and I I currently work as as well as a software engineer, so I don't do security uh, in my daily job. But the CTFs were actually my, my introduction into this into this field. So this was my first hands-on experience of actually trying to work with uh, with security, and uh, and I think it also benefits my my daily work as well because 
unlike some other panelists here, they, they do some, some hands-on security, uh, security work. But uh, in my case, uh, I'm still developing software. And I feel like the, uh, this kind of uh, experience in trying to find problems with software, for trying to find bugs, for example, uh, during a CTF, it does still it still works in your in your daily job so if i look at the piece of code that i've just written and i have this you know light bulb flashing say oh i actually i know how to exploit this what i've just written so then i know oh, maybe i should actually fix this because this is not the right way to do it and i and i feel this is something that's important uh, for for people who do software engineering even if they are not doing uh, security uh, as as part of their job because uh, there are many things that software engineers do hear about. So, for example, they hear, oh, you should avoid I know, buffer overflows. But until you actually understand why or like how this can be uh, leveraged to, to actually exploit the application, I feel like it's not something that you would actively look for in your code. This is something that you will just not notice. If someone tells you, oh, you have, you have a problem here, then you will say, okay, that's, that's actually true. I have a problem there. But unless you're actually skilled in trying to find this kind of problems, you will not notice them when you're actually uh, writing code yourself. So I think from this perspective, it was definitely very beneficial. Um, great, let's let's move on to the next question. And let's stay with the with the benefits from the point of view of the participant. Um, usually when I when I hear especially rep because he works with me, uh, pitch about CTF contests, it's, uh, you know, about how great it is to travel the world for free or for next to free uh, to get invited to, to great places and uh, maybe to learn some, uh, to, to get some awards on the site. Um, and it's, it's all great and it's all true, unless it's 2020, of course. Uh, but um, what would you see as, as benefits for maybe less uh, high profile players? Or uh, you, you touched on some of those topics, uh, of course, but can you give an, uh, can you give some examples maybe from how you started or from other players? Uh, yes, so during the presentation, uh, we didn't say anything about the prizes. Uh, there are some prizes. Uh, and of course, uh, like I said uh, at the beginning, I'm playing CTFs for seven years now. And uh, the knowledge that I gained in the beginning was uh, like it was a lot. And I don't learn as much now. Uh, so, like the way of the style of playing CTFs, some uh, the things that I gain from that now are quite different. So it's um, much more of a competitive thing for me. Uh, so it does matter to me that uh, I'm winning those CTFs. That I'm uh, that as we get top position and the qualifiers, then we got in, got invited um, to the on-site finals and travel the world uh, like almost for free. Or, may, or maybe just for free, because the prices are not that high, but they cover the costs of, of traveling, at least. So it's not something that we can say uh, someone can do professionally, like just do CTFs and, and earn in, enough money to, to, to live on that. Uh, but like we said uh, on this slide with the benefits, the main thing that someone should have in mind while, while playing CTFs is to, is to learn things. So uh, you shouldn't be discouraged when uh, either you don't solve something on uh, or your team or maybe just you and your body and maybe the three of you won't achieve top positions. So if you end up on the like 200th uh, place, it should be only motivating to do a lot more work to learn. Uh, and yes, uh, so when I started with, uh, uh, with just uh, only one other person that wanted to do CTS with me uh, at the time, uh, I think during the first CTF, we ended up on the 40th position. But we were happy. Uh, we were better than uh, some of the uh, like established uh, teams, like the some of the American universities. And that only fueled our uh, our I don't know how to say it the need to do more to learn more to to, to be better at this. 
But then again, the most important I think is, is just to learn things. Okay, anyone wants to add to that? I just want to mention, as, uh, as I think Michal said before, that there are, very, there are a lot of CTFs right now. So you, you probably, if you're just starting right now, maybe you're not going to win like a DEFCON CTF because it's you know high profile, there are, like, there are huge teams trying to play it, but there are also smaller CTFs with, with some easier challenges and you can actually get started on those and you can, you can still win those because it's not like strong teams who are not actually going to play them just because you know they have, uh, they will be playing something something different, and this means that you can still, even if you're like on a, uh, let's say on an aerial level, you just you know this is some kind of like entry entry for you into the field, you can still actually you know win something, and you can uh, you can still have this uh, this fun, even you know without actually winning something that's that's high profile. And this is actually a difference compared to the times we started playing like seven eight years ago. Because when we started, there was like one CTF per two weeks or something like that. And now the number of CTFs really exploded. I think last month there was a weekend where when th there was 10 CTFs at once. So there's really a lot of CTFs to choose from. Yes, I hope we will come to the to the topic of choosing of CTFs uh, later in the discussion, uh, time allowing. But uh, I, I can also add um, that really many CTF competitions are made in the spirit of of uh, learning. So uh, either either the tasks are constructed in such a way that you get clues that will um, lead you through to, to the to the solution, and you will learn on the way. Um, or after all, a lot of uh, teams share their write-ups, um, which clearly explain how they solve the task and you can uh, understand the task better and understand the, the solution and have more fun this way. Um, so let's, uh, let's now move to the position of, uh, of the employer. And uh, Ref will know what I'm referring to. There are, um, there are people arguing that playing CTF is just a waste of time. It's, it's a waste of professional time. It's, uh, you know, it's purely entertainment and uh, it, it shouldn't be done, spe especially in the business hours. And to be the, to be the devil's advocate, um, the, the tasks are, in most cases, designed artificially. They are done specifically for the contests um, or that there are already known vulnerabilities exploited. So um can you prove otherwise that it's it's not just a waste of uh, time of skilled professionals uh who might be better spent on on improving the the software or finding mis uh, vulnerabilities in, in existing web applications uh, yes so just like i said before the entire skill of uh, android reverse engineering that i have now was gained through solving Android uh, and CTF challenges. Uh, so they aren't real, prob real problems. They are self-constrained so that they can actually be solved in, uh, in the time frame of, of, uh, of the CTF. Uh, so that even I, if- I, I think I, I can take on that if you, if you yeah, want to. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. Okay, so- uh, uh, I have a um, very special position in this case because I spent last uh, three or four years working in the bank industry, which is purely commercial and requires like a, a good example of a corporation when everybody is looking on your engagement and um, yeah yeah if you want to engage uh, on your work time in the CTS you need to prove the the value and I can clearly say that over the last. Uh, three, five, three or four years, I, I managed to help s uh, many security and IT related cases uh, just because I had a broad experience in solving uh, CTA, in, in participating in a CTF competition. 
So uh, the, the, the list that I mentioned on the presentation, like if you hit the problem, uh, majority of the people that I work with I had approached like, okay, uh, I don't know how to solve it because this is not my, uh, my area of exper expertise. Like our, I don't know this technology. I'm using, I don't know, VMware, I'm not using uh, VirtualBox, or I'm using Linux, not using Windows. And uh, what, what is so special in people um, playing CTFs is that, like, okay, I, I didn't know that technology, but just give me a one hour and manual and I will try to do something. Uh, second uh, se second uh, type of approach is that, like there is a very complex problem that would require, I don't know, very um, complex and dedicated tools. Like, I don't know, write some custom network uh, understand, net, um, network program that would understand a very specific protocol, to, I don't know, to, to, to help patch something. And yeah, th th this is a good example of the one of the tasks that you can find on the CTFs. Like you have the, some network communication, something like that. And the organizers don't really care if you have already um, managed to see that protocol alive. Your task is to start using this protocol, start to communicate. So uh, when you hit that kind of problems uh, during, during your work, and you will like, uh, if, if you're working in IT, uh, especially in IT security, uh, this is something that you you will find. Uh, another example is the risk assessment, because uh, let's, for example, talk about the the recent vulnerabilities that you can find in Windows, like zero login or something like that. So to be able to properly uh, assess the risk. Because no, normally, like a, I don't know, generic uh, CEO, if he, he will read about the zero login vulnerability on the internet on not a technical portal, he will be scared. Like we, our company will be just attacked by the hackers in a few seconds, and we will go down because we need to patch I don't know, 1,800 computers, and this is taking like I don't know days or weeks to fully patch everything. So. If you are able to understand the nature of the vulnerability, uh, if you are able to understand what are, how can you utilize your current infrastructure to uh, to mitigate those this vulnerability, to minimize the exposure to that kind of uh, vulnerability, you are gaining a huge advantage because you you can technically clearly make an assessment like what are the possible next steps. Uh, and if we are talking about the vulnerabilities in, I don't know, operating system, zero days or so, or so they are not so easy to assess because they are often uh, uh, involve a, a binary analysis. So, and uh, I don't, uh, I'm, I didn't ever see many binary analysis analysts hired in the companies to to have such skill sets. So, uh, as you can see. Uh, I myself uh, were able to prove that this this skill set, the experience that I gained, uh, is uh, quite useful in my uh, daily work. Guys, yes, any the, other opinion? Uh, yeah, the, well, I, I agree with you. So it won't be a different opinion. But uh, summarizing that, not not only gaining technical skills by playing CTFs, uh, I'm learning how to approach problems, different problems. Uh, better and i think it definitely makes me a better professional it makes me it makes me a, a better uh, employee uh, and the proof of that is every person i know that is doing ctfs uh, in p4 and drone sector and other uh, polish and foreign teams they are great at their job and to, at uh, and at what they do in work Yes, and maybe one last thing that I wanted to mention as part of the answer to this question is that uh, even though on CTFs you have those distilled problems and sometimes they are like toy problems that were specifically designed to, to showcase some specific vulnerability, but this also allows people to learn, basically learn, the, learn some basics. So you might find a, a problem on a CTF which is much easier than what something that you would find in, in real life. Maybe you can't really expect someone who, 
who starts in IT security field to, to be able to write some very complex exploit. And it might be difficult to actually even find like a vulnerability in, in real software and try to write that kind of exploit. And on a CTF, you can actually start working from, from simpler problems or from something that's just constrained. So you can actually start learning some basics and then it will actually pile up. So once you actually uh, work with some of those simple challenges, after a while, you'll be able to do some more complex ones. And in the end, you, you will be actually able to, to also uh, try to find and, and work on vulnerabilities in, in real software as well. And also, I think it's, uh, it's not unusual for vulnerabilities to, to be similar to something else. So if someone actually finds a vulnerability of a certain kind, then it might be that very similar problems will be found in the software in, the, in like a short time span because people maybe they, they never actually looked at, at this specific problem. So once someone found it, there will be different, they will be like very similar problems found in, in other software. And I think this is also where, where this helps because maybe you on CTF, you will actually try to write an exploit for some recently discovered vulnerability. And then you can actually find a very similar problem in some other applications, just because you had this, this prior experience. Okay, um, thank you. And I will move to the next question because I want to uh, touch on another important issue connected with, uh, with CTF competitions. And we named the panel, uh, Hacking on the Light Side of the Force. Um, however, the, the, the CTF problems, uh, the, the CTF tasks usually focus on, on the offensive part of the cybersecurity. Um, you mentioned, you know, there are uh, team versus team uh, or, or king of the hill types of competitions which, uh, which require you to defend systems, but most of the um, common tasks are uh, oriented on the offensive part break something, exploit something, uh, decrypt something. Uh, and how do you see the risk associated with, uh, with young people seeing fun of, uh, of, of breaking into systems, breaking into applications? And, uh, you know, they, they might use it to break into their uh, school networks, for example. Yeah, so... Uh... Basically, uh, two aspects here. First is uh, this is just raising the overall awareness about the uh, security or insecurity of the things, uh, because the lack of the knowledge about uh, the insecurity of the solutions that you uh, use on a daily basis is not a good excuse uh, for ignoring them. Like uh, you may think about it, like you have the vulnerabilities in your operating system and just because nobody knows about it you, you feel secure this is like this is the one of the worst ideas so uh when people and uh, additionally those people uh, like this is not uh this is not a fix a scenario that they will uh always intentionally use that knowledge to make something uh, evil uh, they will be better on assessing the security of their solutions that they will meet. Like if they will be developers, they will uh, develop security, uh, par the co pa parts of the application, part of the system with a higher uh, security awareness. And uh, yeah, so of course, this is a very individual ethical aspect that like if one will choose the dark side of the force and uh yeah uh, the, the thing that uh, the second aspect and the thing that was not mentioned in the presentation in my opinion the the highest and the most complex task uh related to a ctf competitions is to try to host your own security ctf competition because this requires not only to prepare the tasks uh make the task solvable but prepare the infrastructure to host those tasks and to implement the vulnerability that you intend to uh, implement and to be able to see, to check that you are not implementing any other vulnerability that would not be intended uh, here. So there is, uh, there is a big part of uh, some, so let, let's call it a blue team approach in a CTF competition also. 
Yes, uh, yeah, so you the, want to add, yeah. Yeah, so the main idea is that if you know how to attack something, you also know how to defend it. Uh, and also, so CTFs are completely legal. So uh, you can attack things, and if you succeed, uh, non-legal consequences will uh, will be there. And I feel that I feel that before CTFs uh, became popular in the IT security world, many of the younger people that were interest, interested in uh, IT security and uh, wanted to try, were ambitious and wanted to try uh, their skills. Were well, maybe not forced because nobody is forced to to do crime. Uh, but the only thing they could do and did was uh, was doing actual crime, so hacking into uh, into actual systems, into actual websites. Uh, and now that that the CTFs are uh, are there, all of that can be made legal. And yeah. And also, maybe from my side, I think uh, CTFs are teaching much more good guys than bad guys like there there's uh, like if you have an opportunity to learn uh, legally and then get a good job then i think that the the final balance is really good despite it it in, in theory also helps bad guys and uh Apart from getting hired as uh, IT security specialist, there, there's also another way to monetize the knowledge, perhaps um, gained in, in CTF, and that's uh, that's bug bounty. You mentioned uh, Rev that it's next to impossible to professionally do CTFs. That it's um, it, it's not enough uh, to to live on the CTF prizes. But how about uh, bug bounty? Is that also something that might attract young people to use the skill on the light side of the force? Yes, why not? Uh, well, personally, I don't like participating in, in, in bug bounties, or rather, I don't have time for that, because if my day would last 48 hours, then maybe I would have some time for, for doing bug bounties on the side. Uh, so the most popular type of bug bounty program is uh, analyzing vulnerabilities in, in websites. And it can be kind of similar to doing uh, web uh, CTF tasks. Uh, so maybe there is some cross-section of uh, skills in, uh, in, in that. Uh, but yeah, maybe someone else uh, has some more experience with, uh, with bug bounties, guys. Not me. I, I mostly treat bug bounties like a uh, incentive if you happen to find find a bug somewhere. This, so I treat this like an incentive to report this to the vendor and to actually spend time polishing the report and sending them. And also a signal that the, they have a, a good pro process to to like analyze the vulnerabilities. But yeah, and what I, 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 I'm not convinced to like uh, leave everything and spend a few months doing just bug bounties. I prefer more regular work and CTFs. Okay, and one uh, of the things that we didn't mention uh, is that in, in my opinion, in my experience, the, the whole CTF community, so the community of the players, the organizers, are uh, interacting with, a, a real, I think, high ethical standards. Like people are not destroying the CTF infrastructure. And if they do so, they are being quickly uh, penalized by that. Uh, so there are CTF uh, rules that are top teams are in general uh, mm, uh, wing. And uh, yeah, as, as, as I said, my, my experience is like that the, the, the whole uh, community, the interactions between people 
uh, stay in the very ethical area. Okay, um, let's let's have one more question before we move to the uh, to the questions from the audience, and let's stay in the ethical topic. Um, as we mentioned before, many of the CTF players decide to publish so-called write-ups after they solve a task, and those write-ups tend to um, describe in detail vulnerabilities and security problems sometimes in, in actual software. Uh, and as we know, you know, patching is, uh, is not always the, the strongest human skill. So uh, there might be a lot of systems out there which are vulnerable to the problems described in the write-ups. Um, do you see that as an ethical problem? Do you, um, do you think there's more value in publishing write-up than risks? How, how do you see that? Well, it's it's still a similar problem to the question of do we even publish IT security knowledge available available to to everyone? Uh, but not, then again, CTS problems are just CTF problems, so it's not like I can open up uh, any of the P4 uh, write-ups uh, and and like copying all the code or the or the exploits that are there and uh, suddenly taking over hundreds of, of websites. Uh, so yeah, I don't think there is a, there is any risk of of, of that. Yeah, as I, 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 for example, as I said before, I think the security by mm, not mm, talking about the insecurityness of solutions is isn't a, a good, like good idea, and they will not uh, mm, last for long. Uh, a good example is, for example, the security of the artificial intelligence or machine learning. Like everybody now uh, thinks, and like I found uh, very often this approach, like this is like, you know, the artificial intelligence is, is making a computer in uh, intelligence being, and it is not possible to uh, exploit the, that technology because this is not a s algorithm. This is uh, like, you know, s something that is mimicking the human brain and uh during la during last few years uh there were a few examples of uh ctf tasks that were uh targeted to actually exploit the weaknesses in uh, artificial intelligence based uh systems so th this is uh a similar uh similar thing we can see in iot uh probably uh a, a part of attendance here uh, have some IoT in home, like I don't know the fridge that is ordering pizza when there is no pizza in the fridge, uh, a, a toilet that is flushing itself when you Bluetooth is near or something similar, and, and a lot of people are not thinking about uh, the this whole environment of the Internet of Things uh, and the devices as a potential threat. And if we start talking about that, and if there are publications uh, in the internet when you can read that uh, there is a like I know a, a camera or a camera used to monitor a baby that has the vulner vulnerability, and attacker can exploit that and I don't know try to peek, uh, try to connect to that to that camera and try to see what is happening inside your home. Uh, people are more aware about. The threat landscape. So, of course, there is an argument that if we, as a CTF community, will not publish any knowledge, uh, so so the the, the the zero zero knowledge sharing approach and everything will be secure at least for a few years because nobody will know how to exploit things. But as I said, this is this is really a short term solution. This will would not li uh, last long. And I think one, one last thing to add is that uh, if the vulnerability exists, then it's already out there, right? Even if we don't write, if even if we don't prepare a write-up or like a proof of concept and, uh, and publish it because there was some similar CTF challenge, it doesn't mean that 
there is no way to find this information. I mean, especially with vulnerabilities which have like CVE numbers assigned and there are usually some kind of uh, security, security notes made by the companies to say, okay, there was a security vulnerability which we patched. Especially if the software is open source, you can always go to, uh, to some software repository to GitHub and check what, what was actually the patch. So it's not like it's impossible to, to figure out the vulnerability even if it, there is no step-by-step -step guide. And I think the, just by publishing it, then there is a higher chance of actually raising awareness that there is a problem. Because if you can actually easily find uh, like a detailed description why this is a problem and how this can be exploited, I think, then many people would actually understand this better and maybe feel more compelled to actually patch themselves or to uh, to force uh, you know some some updates just because of this because they will understand that there is actually an underlying problem and if they are not aware of that then i think it might be a bigger problem if if no one actually knows that there is a pro there is a vulnerability then they they won't be actually pushing for for patching and there's a much bigger problem with uh, publishing red teaming tools. So, example, uh, for example, uh, uh, remote access trojans on uh, on GitHub, and uh, that also helps uh, the blue teamers because, for one thing, they can see how the tool works and then build some defenses, uh, and also use it trying to break in into uh, into their own company. Uh, but with CTFs, the problems are just CTS problems, so I don't really see any any risk with that. Um, okay, I think we barely touched on the on the subject of ethics, but it's uh, it's a very complicated issue in cybersecurity, as pretty much every um, cybersecurity tool or cybersecurity technique, um, even with existing and known vulnerabilities, you can construct a new chain of uh, exploits, for example, that, that might be a novelty and it will be a dual use weapon, basically. Um, so so um, even just the, the issue itself of responsible disclosure could be probably discussed in a panel much longer than, than we had. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to hear that, uh, that the CTF community is um, keeping up the, the good ethical standards and I hope we managed to, to convince also the, uh, the audience that uh, it's actually a good, um, good way of pushing people to the light side of the force rather than the dark one. And now for the, for the questions from the audience, I don't know who clicked, uh, answered on some of those, uh, but I'll try to go back to those. Uh, so one interesting question was, um, do you know, or can you think of any limitations of uh, CTFs uh, in terms of knowledge areas? So what what areas of ITSEC cannot be learned for CTFs? Uh, and, yes. And, and how can how can CTFs in, improve in that in those areas? I I think uh, a good a quick really quick example is the whole whole security governance uh, because if you if the place that uh, if the place that you're doing a security in is uh, a bigger company like 300, a few thousand per, uh, people, uh, there are much bigger security procedures, security regulations out there. And for example, there is a there's a, a gigantic security governance. So, uh, for example, uh, the way that you patch the systems. So. Basically, let, let's just imagine about the company that you have like 2000 computers and you need to patch them. So th this, this is not a trivial problem because you, you cannot just, I don't know, gather all those computers in one place and start uh, pressing a Windows update, review them, etc. Uh, especially in a 2020 when everybody is staying home and everybody is instructed not to uh, arrive to the office. Uh, and th those are examples of the things that are related uh, directly to a security things, but you will not find them on the security competitions because uh, let's say that they are challenging in a different way. Uh, yes, yeah, so CTF challenges are self-constrained self uh, again, and they are pretty much only technical parts of, of the IT security. Uh, so we all know that uh, 
we don't do only technical things in, in our daily work. And I think one of the reasons uh, for uh, how the CTF challenges look, uh, look like they wouldn't be fun to solve if we tried to uh, include every aspect of, of IT security into, into CTFs. Uh, and if solving CTF uh, challenges wouldn't be fun, then I wouldn't play CTFs, basically. So yeah, that, that's a reason for me. Yeah. And uh, One con counter example, uh, and uh, Mateusz should agree with, with me because he was also participating in that competition. Uh, so uh, year over year, NATO is holding a uh, um, workshop, uh, something like a workshop called Locked Shields. And this workshop is very similar to a CTF competition. And they are doing a lot to implement all the areas of the security uh, related stuff that can be observed in your company. Uh, into that competition. So there is a reporting, there is a collaboration with uh, teams, uh, there is a, a, a lot about patching itself. So, but the amount of the effort that they put uh, to organize such competition is tremendous because like, uh, as far as I know, as soon as the one competition ends, they spending uh, the whole year on preparing another one. So. Yes, that's true. There, there is a dedicated team at uh, uh, the uh, NATO CCD COE in Tallinn that uh, is working on organizing uh, the Lock Shields uh, exercise. Uh, and yes, besides only technical uh, stuff in, um, in Lock Shields, there is some uh, uh, legal stuff, media stuff, st even strategic, strategic planning, as it's the like somewhat military oriented exercise. And also, I, th I think someone already mentioned this before, but CTFs are more oriented into offensive side than defense. I think mostly because it's just more interesting and more challenging. So, for example, you, you can learn about problems in software, but you ra rarely have a chance to learn about uh, good software development practices. So CTFs are mostly making you aware of problems, but not always giving you a solution. On, yes, on and uh, Hubert also. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And Hub Hubert also asked, "How can CTF change and improve in that area?" I don't. I don't really think that they need to. Yeah. Uh, I personally think that CTFs are fun and like I I don't really need that they need to be everything. Yeah, I, I think this is them. very important to keep them being fun. So they are attractive to newcomers. So you mean that security governance is not fun? Oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, think so. No. <laughs> As I said, there is a one example of a CTF-like competition, this NATO one, uh, that is aiming to make, a, let's say, a governance part of the fun competition. But yeah, this is one and unique exercise that I found. OK, and uh, the very last question, but I think it can be used as a wrap up for the discussion. What do you think could convince more companies to invest in CTFs? And as you mentioned, for example, for NATO, uh, they invest a lot, uh, but it's a, it's a clear benefit. It's, um, it's basically a military exercise uh, for the nations, for the NATO nations. Like, what would be the benefit for companies? To invest? Uh, yeah, I, I think we already see that the companies are investing uh, slowly uh, in such thing, uh, mostly because we can find a, a, a CTF-like competitions organized by small vendors. A good example here will be a CTF organized, like a CTF-like competition organized by the uh, vendor that is uh, delivering a Splunk uh, CM solution, so log aggregation, log aggregation and 
security monitoring. And this uh, competition is called Boss of the SOC. And it aims to uh, to reward the team that will be the faster to uh, make a specific uh, security analysis. And uh, yeah, so, so this is related to the things that are being done on your daily basis. So you're the SOC operator and you need to sit on uh, near the desk uh, uh, on your duty and uh, like do, do your do your best to uh, react on the things that you can uh, that they, that will happen. And at the, at the same time, this is in a this is organized in a way that is being challenged uh, challenging for people that are being involved. This is a competition, so there are rewards. Uh, there are there are time constraints. Uh, so yeah, maybe in a 2020 it is not possible to see that kind of competition organized in a single place. But uh, on a few conferences, I saw exactly this competition a year ago or so being held during the security conference as a like you know something uh, uh, with a, a clear value for the employee, especially uh, employees from the SOC. Yes, and the CTF scene uh, in itself is very rapidly growing. Uh, I would say that uh, it grows by 50% uh, each year, so so very fast. And we can see that, uh, especially in China, uh, more and more companies are um, investing in uh, in such stuff. Uh, so yeah, we'll get there. I think it's important for the companies to actually see some clear benefit because there are already companies who invest in CTFs. I mean, we, we mentioned like Google CTF or Trend Micro CTF where the company actually sponsors and organizes a, a contest. But I think the, the point is that you have to convince them that there is actually a benefit that they can get something from it. After all, like the, the you know, companies work for profit, so they have to see something in it for themselves. So some of them use it as some kind of uh, recruitment ground. So if you if you invite best hackers for your security competition, then you get the chance to actually talk to those people. So maybe you can try to convince them to actually work for you. So I think some of the companies have this incentive and this is what uh, what motivates them to, to actually try to do this. Uh, as for other incentives, incentives, I'm not really sure like how can we convince companies that this is, this is beneficial for them. Yeah, some companies organize CTS because they want uh, people from all over the world to, to test their solution. Like, for example, we've been invited several times to, to China uh, to test uh, some, some products, some idea uh, in a, a CTF setup like contest. Yes, I, I was about to mention that the two benefits, basically, either testing the product or, uh, or using it as acquiring talent from the from the market, uh, which also, uh, ironically, um, the Polish army is regularly using, for example, organizing competitions to, um, to attract new talent. Um, we are running out of time, but uh, it was a pleasure for me. And I, I hope also the attendees enjoyed the discussion as much as I enjoyed it. So thank you very much for, for your time. Um, I, I guess that's it. So have a good night or have a good day, those who are in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.